Hey, fellow tennis nerds. I hope all is well. Craig Shapiro is a bit of a media icon on the tennis scene. He has been around the tour for ages, since the 90s, traveling as Andrea Agassi's racket tech and many stories from that I'm sure he can tell us. And uh, he runs his own excellent podcast, of which I am a fan, where he talks to pro players and, and whatnot. So check that out. There's going to be a link in the show notes. He has just returned to New York from the Sunshine Doubles, so we're going to get into that as well. But first of all, how are you today, Craig? Jonas, very nice to uh, see you and meet you. I uh, appreciate the time, and I'm good. It's uh, tragic weather here. It's um, it's rain, and uh, I shouldn't say tragic. It's just it's just <laughs> raining here. Yeah, you yeah, yeah. To stay in and lock in, and then you know watch. I think Rinderneck and uh, GoFan just started in Marrakesh, and the matches are going in Charleston and Bogota and. Where else? Uh, Houston, right? So there's some good there's some good tennis to see. How much tennis do you have time to watch? Like when you're not in the t- tournament? Man, you know what? I, I have it on in the background quite a bit. So you know, the home office typically has has the m- matches that are um, interesting and important to me. On I, I I keep my eye on a lot of it. Um, I keep my eye on a lot of it. Yeah. Do you have any specific players you will follow and for a reason that you know them or for like you like the style or how do you usually like choose your matches? Do you want to focus? You know, the only the only um, I I try not to break my rule of being journalistically uh, neutral, but the only two players I keep my eye on um, and sort of break that rule is I I keep my eye on Anisimova because I've since she was a kid, I loved to watch her play tennis. Uh, her Agassi like ball striking has always caught my eye. And now, a uh, friend and colleague, Mark Lucero, is coaching her. So, you know, selfishly, or at least for maybe unselfishly, I, I want to see them play well, and I love to watch her play tennis. Um, and 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 uh, I've cultivated somehow. Dan Evans and I have uh, gra- gravitated to each other. We seem to like each other. He uh, he's been on my show, and um, we maintain a little bit of a relationship. So I I, uh, I I try to keep my eye on his matches too. I I cannot lie. Now his I style like is kid. <laughs> yeah yeah. His yeah. style is great as well, like with the slice and the old school beautiful like strokes, and and the, he's a huge fighter as well on the court. So I'm it's fun to watch. I'm a I'm a connoisseur type of type of I, I'm a connoisseur of tennis. I, I like to think I am. And when I met when we met, I said to him, I said, "Man, you know, you remind me of Hisham Marazi." And he right away knew who I was talking about. Hisham Marazi is a Moroccan player who got essentially around the same. He kind of hovered around the same ranking as as, as Dan. Uh, a flashy, stylistic player with a gorgeous one-handed backhand in the late '90s, and he's actually the tournament director of Marrakesh. And Dan wow. actually pl- Dan Dan plays that tournament because he likes the tournament, and um, you know he likes Hisham. So, uh, you know, I love I love the different stylistic players and, and whatnot. So that's kind of that's kind of who I sort of keep my eye on a little bit. Otherwise, I try to find the best matchups. Yeah, that's kind of the thing. That's the thing that makes tennis so beautiful. It's like the contrasting styles or the matchups that is that are interesting. As not all of them are, but but many of them are these days. How do you think tennis is doing in general? Like you've been following tennis for quite a while. So is tennis in a good spot? You just came back from the sunshine sunshine double, right? So how is the vibe around tennis right now? Man, you know what? Um, I you know it's interesting. Like I always say to people, it's like whatever city you're in, there's a tennis tournament. That is the biggest thing going on. It doesn't. It's the center of the city. It's the center of that town. Um, you know, the, the, those those tournaments they just never get lost in the sauce. They're, they're it's it's big. And and even this morning, we had a call with the Soho House in Rome about doing something with them during uh, the BNL Internazionale during the Italian Open. And young guy said right away, he's like, listen, that's the biggest event there is in Rome. That's it. There's not a bigger event in Rome than that tennis tournament, okay? So, you know, I I think that to answer the question, I think it's a tough question. I think 
um, on the global scale. Um, it doesn't seem like very many people seem to care um, in the in the media centers and the newsrooms. Um, they're not sending they're not sending uh, journalists to those media centers. Um, the the ratings, generally speaking, I think are tragic. Um, you know, very few people are watching tennis um, in general. Um, and I think as a result, we've gotten pickleball. Um, I think I think that that's sort of uh, there's a direct correlation. Um, you know, it's probably a subject for it's probably subject matter for a different show. But um, I, I vacillate on whether we're doing well or we're doing bad. <laughs> Um, I think we got the PIF as a result of a lack of um, corporate interest and uh, the tennis being in the zeitgeist of, you know, of, of tennis being in the zeitgeist. It seems to be very, like, uh, local in a way, right? Like, I mean, in the U.S., you know, with the rise of pickleball, and uh, it seems to be not, like, on the top of people's minds. You hear like, Riley Opelka was on your podcast, listen to that one, it's a great episode. And he was a bit negative about like the where tennis is, kind of, you know. And I, I get it. Uh, but then you go to a like country like Italy. We talk about Rome, right? And the Italian tennis, more tournaments, more pro- players. They have so many players in top twenty. It's crazy. And they have the, you know, the all the politicians are now Italian, almost in the ATP as well. So it's like there, I can see like the, that there is a craze about it, you know. Hey, listen, you know, you know, I, I'm here in New York and I'm in LA, and 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 you know, we're we're very you know, we're very tethered to American things, right? And and we've got the NCAA football, the basketball, the NFL, the NBA, um, and, and 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 similar to the way the associations are tethered to the tennis channel, which doesn't have huge huge reach. Um, those those network those 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 associations are tethered to Disney and 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 NBC and and these big big juggernauts and as a result they're promoted in a way that tennis isn't and you know, one of my big you know gripes one of my real contentious or, or uh, objects of contention is is that. ESPN has the are the rights holders to three of the four majors here in the United States. Pillar to post, first ball to last. Okay, um, Australia, which they've pushed off to their generally speaking, they pushed it off to their their apps. Right, um, they they don't cover the French, and then they have Wimbledon pillar to post and the U.S. Open pillar to post. First ball to last, they they don't promote it with any significance on their, you know, on the flagship news programs at Sports Center. They don't promote it with any significance. They don't drive action to it, and in spite of it, it's still the biggest thing there is. You know, it's like that. Those weeks are just huge. But um, I'm very nostalgic for the days where the tennis was front and center. Um, you know, in 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 the press. Yeah, and how yeah. how is it to be tennis media now on the tournaments? Like I've noticed myself, it's like some tournaments easy to get like a press credential based on like if you have a website, a podcast, whatever, uh, social media. But some way, some tournaments like impossible. You know, is that what, what have you noticed that there's a shift or there's uh, it's just like very difficult to get any access for. Look, uh, listen, I, you know, I, I, I vacillate between whether I really have a place in the media center or not. I what I do is very different from what the people in the media centers do. And, you know, I I I've tried to find a lane that works for me. And, and the fact of the matter is, is when the tournament begins, the player access is limited to the press conferences the, the 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 media covering the tournaments goes from generally speaking screens to the press conferences to do their job and i have great respect for what they do um my my understanding of their job has has uh evolved and i think what they do is a hard job and and um 
you know, Le Mans and Gazette de la Sport and Sky Sports, T you know, the, the, there's and and the British the British press, Matt Futterman at the New York Times. They, 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 there's there's some there's some there's some people. Uh, the tennis podcast when they're I think that when they're um, on the ground at the tournaments. I think that they're providing an invaluable resource. Those those we those daily shows that they do are just um for me they're kind of everything. Sometimes they run a little long for my taste, but I, I think that um what they're do they're doing like, you know, daily hard, interesting reportage and I, I have a lot of respect for that. I don't do that. So I'm kind of taking my fans behind the scenes using my social media um trying to set up meetings for myself with 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 sponsors and potential outlets for my product you know these big tournaments and even small tournaments for me are, are like business conventions so i don't really know if i have a place in the media center um and i don't know if i'd give myself a credential um i don't know if they need me there but I, I I'd like to think that there's a place for someone promoting the sport like myself. And I, you know, I don't let anything stop me. <laughs> so, you know, um, I, I find my way into the tournament, whether it be with a ticket or whether it be with a media badge or whether I be with, um, uh, I have my ways, man. You know, I, I, I get there and I try to show my, show my audience, just how badass this this is, man. Because you know, I love tennis tournaments. I love them. I go to any tennis tournament. I don't care if it's a junior tournament. I don't care if it's a local tournament. Once I see the draw, I want to know who the best player is. I want to know who the worst behaved player is. I want to know who, who's you know, whose father played pro soccer. I want to know everything, and I want I and I have a very hard time leaving a tournament. <laughs> if you know me, if I get to a tournament, I have a difficult time meeting anybody for dinner. I have a difficult time leaving that facility until that last ball is struck. I love tennis tournaments. That's nice. Uh, that 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 puts you in the right spot where you are, right? Like it's it's you have that passion for for just like everything around the tennis tournament and it, they have a nice atmosphere in general like to be around a tennis tournament is infectious in a way right like it's it's just like matches going on left right center oh, you have people right, running right. around it's it's like a nice for vibe for a tennis fan right i love tennis tournaments man and you know part of part of it is there are days where sometimes i don't even see a ball get hit i could have a meeting i could meet somebody i could see an old friend that i went to college with i could see a friend of my mother's, I could open my laptop up uh, on the site and, you know, write my newsletter. I can uh, be setting up interviews for my podcast. You know, I, I, I there are days where I sometimes don't even see a ball get hit. And I realize I'm spoiled, but man, I some of my favorite times is to like, you know, walk the grounds late in the day when people have sort of lost steam and, and, you know, find, uh, find, you know, a player practicing deep, deep on a court. You know, we, I took, uh, Vanch from tennis one and, and, uh, Anastasia from ground pass. Uh, I took them for a walk in Miami and we bumped right into, uh, Dasha Kasakino working on her slice backhand and the sun was coming down and the weather was beautiful. And, you know, I always, I always tell people like selfish or not selfishly, but maybe a little bit arrogantly, like you come to a tennis tournament with me, you'll see it in a different way and you'll love it. Yeah. I mean, you, if you bring like part of the joy and you show your appreciation and your passion, like it's going to be a bit contagious in a way, like you're going to be like, wow. Uh, how did this all start then for you? Like, when did you start playing tennis and like, how, what, what was like the, the origin story? Man, you know, I grew up in Rhode Island. Um, we're New Englanders. My father loved tennis. My dad was self-taught. Um, it was, you know, I'm, I'm 52. And so, you know, 1977, 1978, you know, I had a sawed-off wood racket. Um, I think there's, I have a picture of myself with that racket. Um 
And we grew up in tennis. At that at that moment in time, you know, first of all, the Newport Tennis Hall of Fame was right there. Um, and the players came through. You know, th- those weeks, there was a WTA tournament there. There was a, a an ATP tournament there. And, you know, I've written about it in my newsletter. I, I, I grew up there, and then my father ran a trip from from Rhode Island, a bus trip to the U.S. Open, Labor Day weekend. I've been to, like, at least, like, 35 U.S. Opens, man. Um, wow. And I was at a huge amount of those matches, of the, those middle weekends. And, um, you know, I played tennis. I was just an okay player. Uh, I think my best result, I, I finaled the... Uh, Point Judith Country Club, Rhode Island, Grass Court, Open, uh, 14 and Unders. And I actually lost to a guy named Dave Gordon who famously kicked a field goal that propelled uh, Boston College over Notre Dame. A guy named Dave Gordon. His father was one of the, I think, owned the Hartford Whalers. But I lost to him in the final. But that was my best result. You know, I, 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 I was a high school player. Um, I probably thought more about the story being told than staying present in my tennis. But you know, I I uh, I, I describe myself as a four zero with uh, flashes of five zero tennis in me from time to time. Yeah, it sounds good. Uh, it sounds like a good good level. Uh, Agassi, how did that happen? Like the, the racket takes Yeah, up. so 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 I I was in t- I grew up in tennis. I finished college. I did not play in college. Um, I don't think I could have played in college to be honest. Um, I don't think I was good enough. Uh, I'm sure I'm sure I'm certain I wasn't good enough. Uh, but when I left college, I went. To, I moved to New York. It's a long. I mean, it's not that long. Of a story. I moved to New York City. I was teaching tennis at the New York Health and Racket Club. At the corner of Wall Street and South Street, there's the, there were there used to be these two bubbles that went out into the pier, and there was, I think it was four courts in each bubble. It was you know it's kind of a famous place, and I answered an ad that came over the fax machine <laughs> at the club, Jay Schwai, Jay's Custom Stringing, which um, in the annals of racket technician nests or racket technician he was he and warren bosworth were like the first guys and 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 the 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 story i know is is that andre had had a problem with his rackets i believe it was a an issue of changing companies you know that he had gone from he was always a prince graphite player then he did a deal with Don A. Then he did a deal with Head. Whatever the issue was, I can't recall it, but Jay fixed the problem and signed Andre to a deal where someone traveled with him everywhere. These guys, and everyone copied Andre at that time. So these guys had this customization racket stringing service. Roman is now the, you know, Jay stopped, Jay, Jay's time in this business ended. Roman Prokis, uh, RPNY is the sort of the Yoda of it all, I think, still. And but I work with like, you know, I know Nate and Ron and, and I worked with all them. But anyway, I, I answered the ad, I got the job, and probably, you know, it it wasn't easy for me to learn how to do all that work, but once I got up to speed, I traveled a little bit with Andre and Brad. I went to Australia. Um, Andre lost to Leighton Hewitt in the semis of Adelaide. And then uh, we played Kuyang. And then Kuyang was an EXO. And then we played the Australian Open. I think he lost to Albert Costa in the third or fourth round. I can't recall. He was up. I think he was up two sets and a break. And he gave it back. Or he was up a set and a break. He gave it all back. He hurt his wrist. He never told anybody about that. Um, but we played, we played, I, I went, I went, I traveled with him, man. We played, we went to Monte Carlo. He lost to Sampras in Monte Carlo, but, uh, you know, we, we, he doubled my bets for me at the blackjack table. Like I've got some fun, I've got some fun little stories. Um, he was always just, it was magical. And, and vis-a-vis that, that job, I, I kind of know everyone in pro tennis still. 
can imagine, yeah. Because you're traveling at a, such an like it's an important time in tennis, like Sampras, Agassi, that era. Like I grew up like a huge Edberg fan. Like also Agassi Edberg was kind of my favorites, I think, when I grew up. And uh I think that era has like some kind of golden shine around it. Like it's hard not to to look away from that. Yeah. Well, you know, I I I left that job. I went to HBO. Um, I got I got hired at HBO, and uh, it was like going to grad school. I learned how to become a excuse me a TV producer, uh, documentary filmmaker, digital storyteller, whatever you want to call that. Uh, in sports television, the if you're cooking dinner, you typically buy the groceries and you make it. So. I fill that kind of role as like sports documentary filmmaker. I never was able to find like a great lane for myself in, 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 in tennis because I hate being in the TV truck. I hate, I hate being on headset live TV. It makes me like nervous. Like you can give me, you know, you can give me, uh, 40, 40 or 400 or 4,000 hours of footage. And I'll, I'm not, af- I can, and you know, and, and millions of dollars or whatever the budget is. And I'm not afraid to go and get into a room and, and tell that story. But something about being on like the live truck, it was like claustrophobic to me. I can't, I couldn't stand it. So, you know, in tennis, generally speaking, the the live coverage is all there is they don't really there's not a lot of tertiary secondary and tertiary programming so that was tough i did documentaries on agassi and on sampras for the tennis channel cool um i think both were quite good actually um i'm pretty critical of my work I, i don't know if i'd still think that but i was thinking back to the agassi documentary i did and and there was one interview in particular i i mean i talked to andre for hours for it um his biography came out shortly after that. He left out a couple of things in my interview, but we did one interview in particular with a, a writer, a famous writer. He wrote a very famous story for Sports Illustrated named Gary Smith. And I felt like that interview made my my documentary special. And I think you can still find that on TC Plus or whatever it's called. It was called Agassi Between the Lines. All right, cool. Yeah, and I did a documentary on Pete. I talked to Pete and his wife, Bridget, and, um, you know, Anna Cohn and McEnroe and, and, you know, I've, I've, I've had, I've, and, and Andre and, and, you know, Courier and known these guys since we, I was in my early twenties. And as a result, a few years ago, at sort of the suggestion of a friend started the podcast, but I always like prided myself on being behind the camera, but I, I, I've, I've gotten, uh, I've been pleasantly surprised how I like doing the show and I like the show. I like the show right from the beginning. What what have you learned from like doing the show? Like you met some interesting people in tennis and, and uh, I like the format of it. It's a bit different. You know, like you talked about the tennis podcast, which is also great in its own way. Like they go more like on the weekly, weekly, daily, bum, 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 this happened, you know, it's good to get a, a recap, but you are, you have a different format with your five sets and stuff. And that that's kind of nice, you know, so. So, so my show is a straight up interview show and I rarely share any strong opinions on the show. And, you know, um, and that's kind of how I, that's how I approach like my work. You know, I think like, uh, I, I think your women listeners will probably know better than your men listeners, but there's nothing like worse than being on a bad date where the guy says to the girl, well, what do you do? But the only reason he asks is because he wants to tell her what he does. Or sometimes if I'm in a sports bar or I'm somewhere and someone says, Hey man, what do you think about uh, the the Boston Red Sox? And, but they don't really care what I think. They just want to tell you what they think. To me, that's the worst interview. I hate that. And I don't do that. Um, so, you know, I was, I was wallowing. I joined the creative team at the NFL and I was having a tough time. I was having a tough time there. And, and, uh, the subject of the show came up and there was a guy who worked there who had a hockey podcast called the puck podcast. And his name is Doug and and he has, he has a popular show and, and his show is, uh, three periods, 
So I was like, oh, wait, I got it. I'm going to copy that. I'm going to do five sets. And I had the I had the format right from the beginning. So I love the format. Is the off the court report just sort of gets you into the show. You see where the see where the subject is. If they were doing something interesting, if they just ran a marathon or you know just had an art show or whatever it might be, we might touch it for a second. Then the on the court report is where I like to talk about the business of tennis or, or what, you know, whatever hot button topics I think are interesting at the time. The third set is the, the person's career from beginning to wherever I see it end. And then the fourth set is word association. I call it the 10 ball scramble, which was like a drill that we did when I was a kid, you know, they were just, the, the, the coach would just feed balls all over. You have 10 balls, blow your lungs out. And then the last set is the king of the court. If you were the king of tennis and you could make a change or king or queen, what would it be? So I like the format. I think the format's fun. Um, uh, It it seems like it zips along. I think the the format is, you know, one of the stars of the show. Yeah, 100 percent. Like it's something different. Like and it's also you, you know what to expect. Uh, but it's also kind of you, you do it in a concise ways because podcasts can be kind of wordy. Like it can go like some do podcasts like the Rogan style, three and a half hours, three hours, whatever. Sometimes that that can be a lot. Uh, but this is kind of sippy and it goes on and you get a lot of value in a kind of like fast format, which which I think is very good in today's time. You know, there's yeah, different you know, podcasts for everything, right? I try to think globally and act locally, right? Like I try not to make it too long. My shows are edited. Um you know, in an effort to be smooth and professional, um, I have a criteria that I need to hit. I can't have colleagues like have a show that rambles or is unprofessional. So, you know, the my our, my music is from uh, a friend and colleague, a composer who's a well known man in music. His name is Brian Senti. Yeah, uh, my shows are edited, and and I I take a lot of um, I take I I take I, I prepare. I never wing anything I do. Even my social media, um, I I I don't wing anything. Everything I do is is thought out, and and um, I try to be very professional about it. Does that like mindset come from like documentary filmmaking? Because that requires so much research and professionalism to get it to a good polished product. Yeah, and I and you know I listen. I came from I came from HBO. Um, I, I I don't like listening to to shows anybody's show where they just show up and they just wing it and and don't edit the show and just share what they think. And, and I, I don't like that. Um, it's not who, it's not how I, it's not how I work. It's not how I like to work and it's not how I like to enjoy my content. You know, like, um, it's just not what, it's not what I like. And I don't, but people ask, I, I don't, I don't often get asked for advice, but when people ask me for my advice with regards to, documentary filmmaking or 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 podcasting and stuff i i try to you know one of the things i say is is like don't wing it be prepared know who you're talking to um you know so that's kind of how i try to work yeah it makes sense i mean for everything right like if you're playing a tennis player if you're on the pro tour you need to be prepared like you need to think like what is the strategy what am i doing what's my game plan you can't just go there and be like oh he has a much better backhand than a forehand <laughs> you know then it's... i listen i tell people Jonas, all the time it's like when someone says to me no no let's just go it'll be fine i'm like no 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 it's not going to be fine what are we talking about who are we talking to what's it going to be like um and, you know, and to that point, I tell all my guests, I say, listen, I said, we're not live. Um, I'm not here to, you know, ruin lives or or break, you know, but I try to get to the I try to ask tough questions and I try to ask them. I try to find a way in to where the the guest, you know, shares what they think, where they maybe maybe they won't normally. And I, you know, I, I, I kind of feel like I've got nothing to lose. I'm not tethered to any organization. Um, and I, I, I try to, I try to like, I try to do work that 
I think is interesting and important. And, and, and in a way, I think that we're collecting the history of tennis. Um, I think we're asking questions that are that are that are sometimes not being asked in the media centers and stuff um, or not being hit in a meaningful way. And I, I'm proud of that. Yeah, it's great. I, I really like it. And uh, do you find sometimes that tennis players are like extra guarded, like professional tennis players in the spotlight, top 10 players, top 50 players, whatever? Uh, are they Listen, quite guarded I, when it comes to interviews? Listen, I've had a, I've had a very difficult time booking matriculating pro players. Um, I've had a very tough time doing that. Um, generally speaking, those those relationships are transactional. So, you know, early on I had, I had, uh, Bianca Andrescu on my show. I had Belinda Benchich on my show. I had Sophia Kennan on my show. That was transactional. I have a relationship with a promoter who had a big charity event. I'm sorry, had a big, uh, event in advance of the U S open he helped me get those interviews. Um, the the agents, if there's no money involved, if there's there if if the show's not big enough, I've had a good success rate with X players. My um, determination ebbs and flows. Sometimes I feel extremely resigned to just you. You can see it too. Like you know, you'll see like. The amount of shows I put out is pure effort. I think um, I, I I always make sure to have at least two shows out a month, um, no matter what. But like last month, I put out five shows because I'm just I'm just feeling I was just feeling it, and you know I just wanted to push the action. But no, I have a tough time, I, and I and yeah, the players are guarded, the agents are worse. And the associations are um, totally inflexible and rigid. And it's, um, at least as it pertains to some of us smaller outlets. But I'm doing important work. My show got, listen, my show's been referenced in the New York Times. My show's been referenced in the New Yorker magazine. I had Sergei Tsaikovsky on from, you know, from on the ground in the Ukraine um, I think that was an important show. You know, I, I've had, you know, Annika Runa on my show, which, you know, people really enjoyed that interview. It was right at the time where two coaches, two coaches stopped, Severin Luti and, and, and Boris Becker stopped. Patrick Mortago came back on the bag shortly after the interview, but people really enjoyed that interview I, the mantra for the show is to talk to the most interesting people in the sport and i think we're doing that yeah 100 percent. no i thought that was also important because i think there's a lot of people have opinions about maybe like runa's mother for example people have a lot of opinions and then when they hear her story and her what she is going through or her like opinion about everything then it's it's changes it so that's an important one then in that case you know yeah and i was i, I you know i i always kept seeing her and i her face is always very pleasant. Um, she has kind of a shiny disposition and I kept seeing her and I was like, wow, you know, I feel like people somehow they don't like her and I'd like her. I want to talk to her. And I introduced myself to her in Australia and, you know, a few, a few weeks later we talked and it was really a lovely interview. Um, I've had Karan Tamute on my show. I've had Andrea Petkovic on my show. I've had Dan Evans on my show. I've had Ali Risk on my show. I've had Laura Siegelmund on my show. Uh, Masha Timofieva, who made a little run in Australia on my show. Um, I try to, like, I try to keep my eye out and I try to make it happen. Yeah, you need to push. Like, it's um, something you notice as well. Like, I've worked in media before. I uh, studied journalism like in, in the US uh, 20 years ago or something. And it's sometimes with tennis players, I've noticed like uh, I've worked in politics in the US, right? So with tennis players, it's almost tough for them to talk to congressmen or whatever, you know, because it's like they, they okay, there's nothing in it for me. 
Um, my agent doesn't want me to do it. I have practice and sometimes it's also tough to interview them because they don't feel like they have a lot to say. So it's, uh, it can be tricky as well. Yeah. And you know, like I, I've, I've tried to like play by the rules and it hasn't really worked out for me. You know, like I, I spent years trying to be nice to everyone and it just was like, ugh, this is like, this is just as bad as if I just tell everyone what I think. So I use my social media a little bit more rambunctiously at times. I've kind of mellowed out a little bit. I, I was getting a lot of dirty looks, uh, you know, <laughs> at the tournaments and stuff. And that's not, that's not that pleasant either. And, and, um, not everyone gets the joke and not everyone does, but I'll tell you, man, you know, a lot of, let me say more people come up to me and say, Hey man, I love what you're doing. Then people think that I'm, you know, doing things that are de detrimental to the sport. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that I, I, a lot of, a lot of people in the media centers, a lot of journalists are like, man, I wish I could say and do what you do. And I'm like, well, you could, but you'd lose your job. <laughs> But it, it's the freedom of modern media, right? That you actually, you're your own agent, right? So you can set the tone and then you can follow the numbers. This doesn't work. This works. Uh, this people seems to like, and then you can choose how much of you you want to be. Like if you want to go all in on being like, okay, I'm super honest, blunt, blah, blah, or I'm going to dial it down a bit because I'm tennis is a small ecosystem, right? Like we're all seeing each other on tournaments and man, pay room is small, you know, and stuff like that. Man, I'm a, listen, I'm a field player. You know, like when I go out to the golf course, I don't look through the viewfinder to see what the number is. I, I look down at the ground. If there's a if there's a marker or a stake, I kind of pull my club out based on how I feel, like if I, what I think. And I, I'm a feel player as it comes to this tennis stuff, too. Like, I just I'm a feel player. I just do what I feel. Yes. <laughs> I do what I Yeah. It's a good way to live life, I think. Uh, life, I think. Sunshine Double to get back to that. Like, what was, what were your impressions? Like, we have the fifth slam, people call it, right? Like Indian Wells, uh, huge budget. Larry Ellison, endless pockets. It feels like. Then Miami, they had some complaints about more like, uh, you know, temporary structure of the tournament and everything. So, well, what was your impressions for those two? Well, well, first of all, Jonas, I have to say, like, it feels like it was like six years ago already. I mean, <laughs> yeah. honestly, it feels so long ago, but. Um, listen, when you get to that desert and you start seeing those mountains and the sun comes down on those courts and it's just the best thing ever, there's just nothing like it. Um, it's nice to use clean restrooms. It's nice to be in this like beautiful place. There's just, when they say tennis paradise, that's true. There's just no doubt about it. Um, uh, I was, I thought that the whole vibe was affected by the presence of that PIF branding all over the tournament. Um, I thought the tennis, the tennis is always like uneven and weird tennis to me there. Um, and, and like that's something about that center court. Like it feels like the ball doesn't move at all. Um, it's and we talk about it every year, so I I hate to like belabor it, but I always thought the tennis was pretty uneven. Um, I watched very little. T it was cold. The weather seems like it shifted. Um, and then as I I actually I was there from almost first ball to last with like a little hiccup in between to go get my elbow checked out, but I was there for much longer than I normally am there. Um. It's a, it was, it was great, but I'll tell you, man, I love Miami. I love that tournament. Uh, it's just, it's like a different, like, it's like a different group of people. It's cosmopolitan and it's really the Latin major. It really is the Latin major. Um, and, uh, you know, as you get towards the back end of Indian Wells, it's, it, the, I don't think the crowd is like a very cool crowd. Like, like people don't come down from LA. It's not like a cool crowd. I think at the beginning of the tournament, like all the people, like I, like a lot more people say hi to me at the beginning of the tournament <laughs> in the stadium than say hi to me at the back end of the tournament. People that I gravitate to are the people that are, you know, 
they're trying to see a lot of tennis, trying to find, you know, you know, like economical and affordable ways to see a lot of tennis. Uh, the middle, that middle, that first weekend is a fun weekend. There's no doubt. It's like a spring break for adults. People go crazy. Um, you know, but, uh, that Miami tournament, boy, what a what a crowd. It's just like, if you go find your way to... I wrote about it in one of my newsletters. I just said that Miami hits different. The coffee hits different. The tournament hits different. The, the Latin prevalence is great. Um, they come out so hard for... The one thing I will say, though, is, is that we have that transcend, transcendental athlete with, with Carlitos. Both... Both both places, they don't care. They don't want to see him kick the shit out of somebody. They want to see him practice. They want to see him walk. They want to see him stretch. They want to see him. They want to see him. He is box office. He's big. I, I hadn't seen that since, obviously, Rafa. Uh, no, uh, you know, Novak doesn't even really have it like that. Uh, Carlitos is a destination athlete. People are traveling to see him play tennis. Curios, people travel to see him play. When he was in a draw and he's playing well, people travel to see him play. Yeah, no, one hundred percent. I love my, I love that Miami tournament. The best, the best moment of that Miami tournament was the rain that came at the at, at that Friday and Saturday. It screwed everything up so bad that uh, Jonas, when the when the when the when it, about three o'clock Saturday, I think there was like sixty five matches <laughs> that got played, and it was just the best thing ever. <laughs> yeah, it's so much to choose from there. No, it looked really cool. Like, what do you? Yeah, Alcaraz for sure. Now he has his own uh, Netflix show coming up as well. So he it shows the the marketability of that guy. Like his like infectious smile and and the way he plays. You just like. Kind of uh, like you said, he 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 travels that guy right through hey, generations. He, he, people travel to see him. He is legit official box office. I don't know if that's true for Sinner, um, but it may be. I have to kind of, I have to kind of put my eyes on that a little bit closer. Um, and obviously, we're going to be in Rome, so that's going to be cool. But listen, I love both tournaments. Uh, People have issues with uh, the stadium for the center court in Miami. I understand that sentiment. But, man, when you're out on those grounds, it is good. Those grounds are good. And the crowds are great. And like I said, if you if you hit the weather, the, the, the tournament kind of goes the way the weather goes. If it's, like, super hot and oppressive, it's tough. And if it's not as hot and it's kind of nice, you kind of get to that place where – you get to that magic hour. There's just nothing better. That Saturday that I just referenced, that first Saturday, uh, was it Saturday? Yeah, I think it was that first Saturday. I locked in on court one, which is just a small court way out deep. And it was like match after match after match. Uh, Dan Evans lost a unbelievable match went to Chris Eubanks. Chris Eubanks and Dan Evans had a stylistic war that was just awesome. And then and then Gal Monfi played on that court next. It was just one of those one of those great days at the tournament. Uh you know, IMG owns that tournament. They're doing things to uh be hyper competitive with Indian Wells. There's a Nobu on property. There's all the all the stuff that they have in Indian Wells. They have it in Miami now, and I really enjoy that tournament. I love that. I love Miami. I can't it, deny it. I love Miami. It looks great, and it's also like a contrast. So you have like more the country club vibe of like the second week of Indian Wells, and then you have the more vibrant colorful like latin inspired miami so it's it, they work together in a good way like if both were very similar it wouldn't be nice so it's good that they are different and they feel different you know no doubt 100 percent. so now we're getting on the clay right so what are you most excited about uh besides probably your rome academy in may like do you want to talk selfishly, about as well but selfishly all i care about right now is like i'm still kind of licking my wounds from the sunshine double um 
I'm going to keep my eye. I need some mobile plays. Uh, Pagula tonight in Charleston. Uh, that's a lovely tournament. I highly recommend if you're, you know, if you want to see something pretty cool, go see Charleston and, and go see that tournament. It's fun. Um, it's interesting. The heart true doesn't look nice on TV, but it's nice when you're there. It looks sweet. And it's, and that, and that center court is sweet. The tournament is beautiful. And that city is a fun little city to bop around in for a few days. There's no doubt. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I want to see if like some of these, you know, I, I like to, I like it when I like it when the South American guys make moves during this time. I like it when, you know, uh, an Italian plays a Brazilian. And I, I just love I love when, you know, I want to see Cazzo and Arthur Fees and I want to see, you know, uh Cam Nori like torture everybody with that like knuckly backhand and, and I just you know I don't know I I, I want to see you know listen now Novak has Ninad Zimjanic on his bag uh, that that story is a real story Novak no it took I think it took Novak longer to kind of do some breaking up <laughs> than maybe maybe he wished but. Make no mistake, he did that. You know, he jettisoned Goron, which I think I wrote about that in my last newsletter. I thought that was very sad. Um, Goron is just a sweet guy. You know, he you see, he just has that face that is very sweet. And um, you hate to see them break up. But uh, Novak, Novak's made a lot of moves, but he is in Monte Carlo ready to rock. I hope the weather stays nice uh, for this, for this, for these tournaments, because um, I feel like sometimes the weather dominates the, the conversations, and then it, and then nobody really gets cracking until like Madrid, Barcelona, and then Rome, and then it's then it's go time for Paris, and the weather seems to be always like you know. With the exception of, I don't want to jinx it. Actually, I don't want to say anything about the weather. <laughs> <I'm not gonna> <laughs> <laughs> Let's cut that out. No, no weather talk. Yeah, yeah. We had like, I mean, south of Spain, Marbella, so where Novak lives, right? And uh, Safiulin and a lot of the, the players here. And Evans is here, and Murray comes to train. And stuff. Yeah. And we've had like talk about weather, uh, like ten days of rain before I arrived. I was in Malta, but now I'm back here. And uh, yeah, people are a bit shocked, like because there's no there are no indoor courts here. So you're like, okay, there's gonna be no tennis almost in a week for a pro player. Or, or well, that's, you know, been like that. that's been happening for the sunshine. That's been happening in LA. These everyone's coming in early, and it's been raining, and there are no indoor courts. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, it's happened now. That's the new thing in LA. It rains every day. <laughs> yeah, it's a new new trend. Yeah. Uh, so, so your plans, like you're going to Rome. Are you going to be in other tournaments as well during the clay court season? Uh, we're, we're, I'm very fluid at the moment. Um, I have no plans other than to be in Rome. Um, you know what? During COVID, I I started pretending that I was the head of a tennis academy that didn't exist, and then I actually put a few itineraries together in 2021. No, no, 2022, 2022, and we went to Miami. And then we went to Newport, Rhode Island. Then we went to Guayaquil, Ecuador. Then we went back to Miami. We had these four, um, you know, very curated, cool. Uh, I just called it the Academy because I just want to like co-opt that word. I just co-opted the words. Like, if you want to be in my Academy, we do this and we do that. We like to eat good food. We're not like everyone else's Academy where the food's bad. And it was sort of performance art. It was kind of a joke. But then the people, you know, but people saw it on my Instagram page and they thought it was fun. And they said, man, I don't know if this is real or if this is fake, but I want to be in this academy. So we, so anyway, we're going to do a trip. It's a, 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 I have 12 books. We're going to the Italian open. Um, super cool dinners every night. Uh, practices every morning uh, at, at, at some nice clubs. Uh, the Due Ponti and uh, the Circolo Canottiere Roma, which have, they they claim they've got the best clay in Rome. We're gonna see, and uh, and then you know we attend the Italian Open, and it's fun. It's 
it's less structured than I think other uh, trips. It's and I priced it to sell it. So you know we have you know the gift. I always say the gift bags is worth it. Is worth as much as uh, is worth as much as the trip. <laughs> Tennis fans coming together, and you all have a shared passion, right? So it's like usually there's such a great vibe in these types of trips. Oh, uh, it's so cool. You know, I I I tell people it's like man, I've never. I, I would never know someone who does what you do for a living, but because of this tennis, we're all here and it's fun. And I've, I've met a lot of different people and we've built this little community. Um, you know, I'm not for everybody people, you know, they don't, some people, they just don't get the joke and they, they don't get the joking around sometimes. And I get that, but a lot of the the ones who do, we have a good time. We eat good food. We get we break a sweat. We try to get a little better. Um, we don't we don't zone. We don't like you know kind of drill down on too much tennis. It's ninety minutes in the morning, and we kind of keep it moving. Sounds good. And you have coaches there with you, or how does this yeah. structure work? Yeah, 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 yeah. I always yeah, yeah, because I, I basically break everybody off, try to get everyone kind of set up level wise, which is always tough. I actually think I'm an expert at it. I think I do a really good job of getting everyone their tennis. And then I just have the, I have pros dedicated on each court trying to, you know, run people through the, like try to hit a lot of balls, try to get everyone moving. Not a lot of chit chat. Nobody, nobody really wants to hear too much instruction on vacation. Um, and I kind of float. I kind of float and give a little instruction. If I think I can help somebody a little bit, I do. Um, and that's what we do. And then we go to the tennis. We shower, we shower, eat, go to the tennis. And, um, man, what a year to be at the Italian Open. It's going to be unbelievable. I cannot wait. Yeah, I think this year, I've been there like a bunch of times. And uh, it's it's always been great. Like, uh, I love Rome. Like the food, you you mentioned the food. Uh, like the food is amazing. Do you have the atmosphere? You have the history. You have the culture. You have everything there. Like if, it's if like you being on love a, life, it's like being on a movie set, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. You're, you're like a constant movie set. Then you you package that with some good tennis. You're playing tennis. You're watching tennis. I mean, as a tennis fan, you're in heaven, right? So so it's like it can't be better than that. I don't think really. Uh, so that's going to be excellent. But now also with all the Italian players, I mean oh. before. It was like Musetti, maybe and Berrettini, and Berrettini maybe not so good on clay. But now there's endless names of Italian players, and I, I'm sure the crowd will go nuts. I, it's going to be probably packed every day. Right? It's going to be unbelievable. Um, you know, the tournament is long now, right? It's it's uh, a long tournament. We're actually there for like the first three days of the main draw. You know, because. You know, it'll be like heavy action, and I like to put my people in the action. Um, the back end of the tournament, there's so much less tennis, and the grounds are quieter and stuff. So we're there at the front, and I think it's going to be really, really fun. I don't wing anything, like I told you earlier, and I don't wing these trips. Like these trips take like real effort and real planning and leveraging connections and, and, and doing all these things. And I have a partner, a uh, young woman named Alyssa Lee, who helps me with the stuff, with the work. And I want people to leave saying, man, that was the best time of all time. And, and to that point, we've had all my players have come back. So you yeah. really have a proper academy then, <laughs> if it's the same guy. I, like I have repeat, I have repeat players. They come back. They've had a great time. It's almost like summer camp. Like, you ever go to camp, they, they actually, like, stay in touch. They want to hang out. They all met up at the U.S. Open, which made me feel good. You know, I didn't I didn't know what my life would be like at, you know, 52. And um, it's fun. We have a lot of fun in tennis. And, uh, man, I never knew when my dad, you know, put us in play like this, that we would be doing this much stuff. And, you know, I got Patrick McEnroe texting me and, you know, I talk with Jim Courier and 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 Justin Gimmelstab and 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 all the different people in tennis. Uh, you know, I've been really grateful. The sport has afforded me like a lot, and um, you know, we're trying to have fun with it and hopefully make a few bucks uh, along the way as well. You know. Yeah, yeah, you have to do that. So, what? Who do you think uh, will rule the clay? What do you think of Rafa's uh, return? Will he be back for um, f and to, to to play some good tennis on clay or? 
We worried? Man, I, I you know, when he when he tore his hip, I wrote a post on my Instagram and it was the picture of his hand all taped up and ripped up and I just said, you know, man, you know, there's never been anyone like you. I don't want to see, I hate to see my heroes fail and my heroes fall, right? We see it in boxing all the time. I, I prefer he didn't play if he's not ready to go, it's like really ready to go. That's all I would say about it. I, I hate watching. I don't need to see him lose, you know, 4-3 in love. I don't need to see that. Um, other people seem to want to see that. I don't want to see that. Uh, I'm, I'm here for who's in the draw. I'm here for who's playing. Um, I think that if he's not in Monte Carlo next week, chances are he's not going to be ready to go no matter what. That's kind of yeah. how I feel right now. Yeah. Um, and listen, what a career, like, like people, you know, I, I'm, I'm a realist. Like, I, yeah. When he says I'm done, is that going to be sad? Yes. Is it already sad? Yes. But I feel like that about a lot of players and athletes, you know, like when they end, it's, it's like, ah, oh, man, I'm going to miss seeing that player play, but that's what, but that, that's sports. That's life. Right. Yeah, I mean, ju just look at Roger's retirement. Like, I think uh, both Rafa and Roger cried. It was the Labor Cup, right? And uh, uh, But Roger, if you see his Instagram or, or judging by how he's living his life, he's, like, uh, <laughs> looking like a million bucks, like, having so much fun, you know, oh, just man. enjoying. I, I said to some people privately, and I'll say it now, it's like, a part of me wished Rafa had quit right then. He just said, I quit too. <laughs> you know, like, part of me wished yeah. they had just stopped at the same time i actually when that happened i was in the players lounge the players lounge at the san diego open and verdasco was there and 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 all the players were watching it just mesmerized at what you know what generational special magical talent these guys were and what a scene that was and i wish that maybe they just bookended it right then and there and that hasn't happened, but no matter what happens, I'm down for it all. I love it all. I would love to see, you know, I, I, I root for underdogs. No, I'm, I, I love to see players make runs and I, I love, and I support women's tennis. I love to watch women's tennis when it's good and when the matchups are good and, and everyone's playing tough. Uh, I love to watch Igor Fiontech play tennis. I love to watch... On Jabor when she's playing well, I love to watch Dar Dasha Kastakina play tennis. Um, you know, I've watched Madison Keys play. I, you know, I'd love to see these players play, but I really, I really hope that like I mean, Amanda Annie Samova can play well this year. Uh, I love the way she plays tennis. Um, she got on my radar when she absolutely destroyed Sabalenka, I think, in the quarterfinals of the French Open. It was like Agassi-like ball striking. I always say it. Um, you know, some I like to. I, I always, even when I was a kid, I like to try to find like who the next big thing is going to be. You know, and and uh, you know, I love uh, I love that uh, Dutch kid, the 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 talent Greek sport. He is wicked. Uh, we watched Talon Griekspor play Hubert Hurkacz on court seven, I think, at the French Open last year. It's one of the best matches I ever watched. It was unbelievable. Um, I actually just signed a deal with Scope Sports. Uh, these guys have a uh, these guys have a cool platform for fan, for fan clubs. And they have Greeks for and Kaboli where they're, you know, if you pay a, you pay a very nominal fee and you get this like special access to the player. Um, so I, you know, I actually, I actually watched Kaboli play a tough match in, in Miami as well. So I like to see these young guys coming up. I can't get over how good everyone is, particularly in men's tennis. I can't get over how good, how good everyone is. <laughs> See Luca Nardi uh, take out Novak, even though Novak was distracted, was something special. And Luca Nardi went up fifty points in two weeks or in two tournaments, yeah. which I think is really cool. So yeah, man, I love it all. I even listen. I watched the juniors 
at they, they had a very cool invitational round robin. Oh, I don't know if it was a round robin. They had a cool invitational at Indian Wells with the best juniors. And I watched the junior boys final and I had a, I just, I loved that. It was a great, I mean, the level is great. The level was great. The tennis was great. Yeah. Tennis is so good these days. I, I think like if you, if you talk to players like playing futures or whatever, it's like the, especially on the futures, like up to 1000, it seems like the level of tennis is so high, even if you go down in the rankings now, then maybe compared to 10, 15 years ago. And, and there's so many young players now also coming up, winning challengers, winning futures early. Like it's, it's just like the, the tennis world is, is definitely evolving, it feels like, with all these young players. Oh, the level is just out of control. The level is out of control. I, I literally, like, I, I just can't believe how good everyone is. Um, yeah, I mean, listen, I'm going to go to, I, I if I don't go to the Yankees home opener on Friday, uh, I'm going to go to see Columbia play Princeton. That tennis is unbelievable. The college tennis is unbelievable. The junior tennis, the little kids playing is, I, I like it all. I like all the tennis and I watch as much of it as I can. And if I could figure out a way to, you know, make, you know, $10,000 a day, every day, you know, at a tournament, <laughs> I would do that. I would just, just be at tournaments. Yeah, yeah, it's a good life. It's a good life. How often do you play when you're uh, you're uh, at home? Man, you know what? I'm hurt. Uh, when I when I, I I I was pushing the action, um, man, I've tried to play three to five days a week. Um, I recently, you know, I, I, a year ago, I I actually put a a set of uh, aloe power into the ra into my racket. I play with a play with a percept. It was the V-Core Pro. I actually was playing with the V-Core Pro L, the light one, the lightest one that you can't even buy in the States. I was playing well with that racket. I changed my string setup to the Aloe Power just to, and it, I loved what it did to the racket, but it put my arm in total um, disrepair. And I managed that injury up until the beginning of the year. And now I'm, I'm in like... I'm in like a fair amount of trouble. I have to see what's next. I'm going to probably do a PRP shot right here. And mm -hmm. then um, if that doesn't get me all the way back, I'm going to do a surgery after the summer. So I might just pop, I might just pop Voltarens and get back on the court. I'm definitely going to play in Rome. So I'll play through the pain. I can get the elbow warm and play, but it's almost, it's almost out of control um, pain. There's a torn ligament, a torn tendon, and four bone chips. So it's I'm in trouble. Jesus, yeah, yeah, that's a, yeah, that's yeah, a lot. Not great. Yeah, not great. Yeah, yeah when I not do great. racket consultations, I get a lot of that, um, where people they, they switch maybe to a poly from from playing multi or from they they increase the tension or they switch a racket and suddenly <laughs> like your muscles not used to it and all the power is famously stiff, right? What what tension did you use? Very high or? No, no, I probably strung it at. 47 pounds okay, yeah, but yeah. i just it was just not it just it felt like a lot it felt like a lifetime achievement award for for uh playing a lot of tennis for a lot of years i thought you know you know my i think my form is pretty clean um i i'm, I'm pretty certain that the string like started something that i probably should have put the racket down and i didn't and it's a, it's a sad club player story that um, getting old isn't the best, Jonas, to be honest with you. The, the tennis isn't great for your body, but I'll be back. Yeah, of course you will. But what did you use before? I'm curious now. When in the strings, what did you play Man, with? Whatever, whatever is free. I, I was using one of the Yonex. Yonex is my, Yonex is my company, and I was using uh some of whatever their their that black string that they uh have yeah strikes maybe um yeah. polyto strike probably polytor strike yeah yeah like 17 gauge it was good and then yeah. i then and then then roman switched me to you know when my arm was killing me i switched me to the polytor strike in the mains and natural gun in the crosses which felt great, actually. I was playing, you know, I, when I could get the arm warm, I was playing pretty well. And then I just, like I said, my arm was killing me. I played this summer and the pain just struck all the way up and down the arm. And then I was able to get everything under control except the elbow. The elbow is totally out of control. 
Yeah, that's rough. That's rough to hear. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a lot of people suffering from it. I think that's one of the issues in tennis is that people, they fall in love and they want to go hard and they play like maybe too much and they don't do maybe the strength and conditioning in between and stuff. And tennis, like you said, it, it, it kind of more breaks you down. Then you need like gym and, and rehab and other stuff to just maintain that tennis, you know? Well, there's listen, if you want to play a lot of tennis, it can't be your main exercise. You know, you have to work out to play elite tennis. And you have to, you have to work out no matter what age you are. And um, yeah, the, all the twisting and turning and all that kind of stuff can be tough. But yeah, I never had had any elbow issues until I put that aloe power into my racket. So... That's what I'm sticking to. That's what I'm blaming it on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You got to blame it on something. I, I know that. Like, we're all of racket nerds. They, it's always nice when you have a new racket, you know, and you're like, okay, I can blame today's performance on this racket. It's always a good feeling. You know? No doubt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I always bring a lot of rackets to the court. Uh, so what's, what's next now? Mont Monte Carlo, you're going to keep watching? Yeah, I'm going to, like I said, uh, Annie Samova plays Pagula tonight. I think Dan Evans goes tomorrow. I got to see his draw in Marrakesh. As I said, I'm kind of licking my wounds a little bit. Uh, I have to write my newsletter this week. I just had, listen, this is important. Jose Higueras, um, the great Jose Higueras, born uh, in Spain, grew up in Barcelona, and then came to the United States, one of the elite, got to six in the world, semifinals, uh, Roland Garros twice. He was the coach of Chang and then Jim Courier, most famously. He left a job with Roger Federer to join Patrick McEnroe at the USTA. He penned a letter, um, a very concerned letter, uh, expressing his disappointment and 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 complete, you know, concern that the that United that American tennis is going to. Is going to is going the the, the the pending demise of American tennis is just about upon us because of budget cuts that the USTA has made to their player development program. He wrote that letter. The only person who covered it was Matt Futterman at the Athletic, which is a you know derivative of the New York Times. Yep. Uh, and no one else has really talked about it. I had him on my show. That show is making waves. So you know I'm gonna try to you know, kind of stay on top of that story to some degree. Um, I'm talking to Mark Ein, the the tournament owner of Washington, D.C., the city Mubadala Open, because yep. I want to get his perspectives. He's had an interesting life in tennis as well. He's one of these billionaire trophy big tennis supporters. Um, those guys are getting kneecapped by this deal with the PIF. I'm interested in, you know, learning about that. So I keep it moving. Um, I'm not totally sure what I got it. Listen, usually, I, usually when the smoke clears, I look at the draw, I look at the turn, I look at the schedule, and I'll I'll be you know I always have the tennis on in the background for sure. And Monte Carlo, there's just nothing like that. You win Monte Carlo, that's a special thing. Yeah, yeah, it's a beautiful event to go to. Yeah, so that tennis is in a bit of, I mean, there's a lot of happening, right? Well, with the PIF, for sure, you know, and they talk about, like, this super tour, and they talk about all kinds of politics. I think they talked about it on the on the Rodic podcast last time uh, as well, right? The, the served. Uh, it, it's just, like, people are concerned, but at the same time, it's a good thing that people put money into tennis, uh, of course. So it's, it's like, it's a, a lot of things happening, a lot of things to keep your pulse on. Yeah, it's a it's a, it's it's a loaded question. I don't know enough. I don't know enough of the politics of tennis. I I don't. It, it's it's such a closed door industry. Yep. That I I can't even I can't even purport to know how it all is working. But you know, Jamal Khashoggi was a journalist that was critical of the Saudi government and. He was murdered and chopped into pieces and taken out of an embassy in uh, the Turkish embassy in bags. And um, I'm not that into that. So, you know, I, I want to learn about what's going on. You know, I want to know what happened to Mercedes Benz and why they left tennis and all these billionaires that. You know, Georgi Paulo uh, Lehman in Brazil and, and, and Larry Ellison and, and, and Mark Ein and, and 
and now uh, Emma Navarro's father, you know, Ben Navarro. These, these, I want to know what the machinations are of the sport in a way that I can understand it, but maybe I never will. But I will say this, anybody who's got a tournament that isn't going to be part of this new tennis, shoot me a note because I'll bang the drum for you. I'll come to your event. I love every tennis tournament. I don't care whether it's ATP or WTA. I'll come to your tournament. We'll bang the drum and we'll have a blast. We'll do an academy. That sounds good. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's that's great. Like it's it's all about the sport anyway, right? Like I think sometimes the politics overshadow the sport a little bit because you have so many different organizations and it's it's messy. Like it feels like a messy thing where you can't get a grasp of what's going on. Like I agree hey, with man. that. 100%. Listen, there was a golf event in Jeddah or Riyadh a, a, a month ago, like right I think right at the same time of Indian Wells. It was the weirdest thing ever. There was nobody there. They had DJs on each hole, and the whole thing looked totally tragic. Nobody's going to Saudi Arabia to watch tennis, man. They, those guys, people are going to go play, but no one's going there to watch tennis. No, I, I, I would uh, agree with that. I, I think it's also like such a big, like people apprehensive for many reasons, but it's like just doing a big shift of everything from like what tennis is, is, is not going to gel well with the general tennis audience, right? Like we're kind of, tennis people are pretty traditionalist as well. So it's also that, you know. Well, I'm not going to I'm not going to Riyadh at the back end of the year for an event. <laughs> no, no. no. It's just, it's just, it's just not, it's just not how I'm going to do it. I might I might go to Marrakesh, see Doha one day. I'd like to see. You know, I'm not afraid of the Middle East, but um, I saw what those tournaments looked like in Jeddah. I thought that looked stupid. I'm not going there. That's not that's not for me. Someone else can go there. One of the influencers on Instagram can go to can go to Jeddah or Riyadh and uh, tell me how great it is. I ain't doing that. <laughs> yeah, we'll no see. Way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I agree with you. Yeah, so we'll see what happens to tennis. But we, we, I think that the message remains: like we love tennis, we want the best for tennis, and uh, fingers crossed that it all turns out pretty well. We Listen, should be in Wimbledon a good space. ain't going anywhere. The French Open's not going anywhere. The Phoenix Challenger is not going away. Like all these tournaments, they're going to find a way. The sport always is bigger than anything else. So hopefully it'll be fun. And if someone can explain to me what's going on, I'd be grateful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You need to do some hard, uh, hard pressed interviews. We'll see. We learn we'll from see. that. <laughs> yeah. All right, Craig. It's been great talking to you. I know you have a busy day, busy life. Um, tennis to watch. Charleston. I want to go to Charleston. Um, everybody talks highly of that tournament and the city. So. Hopefully one one year I will. Uh, but it was really, really nice talking to you. And I hope we can uh, keep in touch. Hey, I enjoyed this. Thank you for uh, inviting me on your show. You guys do a great job. Um, thank you for not making me talk about racket specs and string setups and patterns and grips and stuff. Um, funny, I, at, at one time in my life, I really got bogged down with that because I was doing that work. But um, I'm a little bit triggered by it. So I appreciate I leave that to you guys. And uh I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. I'm. I'm. I. I love my my strings and the lead tape and stuff like that. But it's. I also love tennis. So it's more like you. You want to have the conversations outside that stuff as well because that's like every day. Otherwise, <laughs> you know, you go nuts with it. No doubt. All right. Well, have a nice day and uh, and we keep in touch. All right, brother. Thank you so much.